Hello, my name is Thomas Richter. I'm the COO and co-founder of Swarm64. We started our project in 2011. And my objective today is to talk a little bit about relational databases, a topic that has gotten a bit out of fashion and maybe is getting back into fashion. We'll find out. And um, I chose this old saying, you know, the king is dead, long live the king. Because um, at some point, let's say in 90s, for example, there was no question that when you talked about data analytics in any way that the names of Oracle or IBM would be the first names people thought about. And this is something that has profoundly changed. And maybe not in the shape of Oracle or IBM, but maybe there is a small kind of renaissance of the open source databases that's on the way. And this is the topic of my talk. And Swarm64 is extending existing databases, especially open source databases, and teaching it some new tricks. So this will also be something I will be touching in my talk briefly. So um, the king is dead, long live the king. When I was, for example, using IBM Cognos in 2004, I felt like the king of the world. You know, I could do big data. I could use, use OLAP cubes. This was the thing back then. Or actually, maybe it was the thing 10 years earlier and, and it hit, until it hit uh, big German companies. just took a little while. Um, but then Google happened. And the kind of whole paradigm of how you would work with data was kind of shifting because Google was really genius in what they did. And then they also wrote a paper and explained to the rest of the world how they did it. And then other people made, of course, open source adaptations, the most famous one being Hadoop. And the interesting thing is that this has done something to the databases. So the databases, and now I'm talking about the open source databases that have been around for a very long time, namely Postgres, Postgres SQL, Michael Stonebreaker database, been around for almost 30 years. MySQL, which had its big run in the 90s, and actually in the late 2000s, Google was really into it. Then, of course, MariaDB, which happened after MySQL became part of Oracle because Sun Microsystems became part of Oracle. So all these databases have been in market very, very long. And being pressured by other systems, they're finally reacting. So, for example, Postgres, uh, Postgres SQL, which is a one of these databases has finally gotten parallelization. Wow. 2015, I think, was the update, or 2000, early 2016, parallelization. Well, what a, what a thought, you know? They lived something like 26 years without. Okay. Um, and another thing is, and this is actually quite exciting, they've also started to blur the boundaries between document store and relational database. So if you're thinking, for example, of um, this whole movement around binary JSON, so you're starting to put JSON objects that can have a hierarchy, that can have arrays, that can be dynamic, as in, in every single row, the object you put there changes. Suddenly, you can put that stuff in a relational database. Suddenly, you can use operators on that and do things. And this is why I'm thinking, you know, there's this term no SQL, which in the beginning meant to say it's not a SQL database. And then it started to be interpreted as not only SQL, because solutions like, for example, let's say Pig or Hive or Impala, you know, like database-like solutions, even CouchDB, they started to use SQL as a query language because it's so nice. It's like a crude version of English. You know, you can kind of express what you want and then you get it back. But I would argue that the, the not only SQL now even extends to those old SQL databases. You can have binary JSON, you can have these objects, and you operate on them using JSON operators, which have concepts of hierarchy, of relatedness, of arrays, and so on. So point is, these databases are starting to learn new tricks. Open source databases like MySQL, MariaDB, Postgres are learning new tricks. And one of the tricks we're teaching them uh, is by Swarm64.
So what we are doing is we're using the APIs that these databases have, and we extend them transparently for real-time data applications. So what do you mean by real-time? What do I mean by real-time app uh, data applications? We are enabling these kind of databases to eat not a few hundred thousand records a second, but to, heat, uh, to eat millions and millions of records a second per computer. And that means that suddenly you can not only do all your relational database stuff, but you can also do all your real-time data analytics. Let's say, for example, you're tracking sensors or you're tracking network traffic. You can analyze this directly within your relational database. And the way we're doing this is we're using a new accelerator technology from Intel that's just been released. And this is basically a completely different mechanism of accelerating things. It's you're expressing part of your logic as real hardware. It's like a, it's called FPGA. That's a bit of a mouthful. Um, field programmable gate array. It's basically a chip that wakes up and says, what should I be? And then it reads a configuration, and it realizes, oh, I should be that. And then it actually performs at the efficiency as if it was a chip made only for that purpose. And this is what we're using to teach uh, open source databases like Postgres, MySQL, MariaDB, new tricks. So we basically take the database, the existing database, and we put the FPGA in, and we put things like a runtime and a driver around it. In short, we're hiding all the complexity from the end user. What you get is something that looks exactly like Postgres and or MariaDB and or MySQL, and you can use it for real-time applications. One interesting thing there is, you might say, this sounds a lot like stream processing. And in a way it is. But the difference is we are capable of actually putting all this data I was talking about, and I'm talking millions of records a second, we're capable of putting this into the database so you can actually analyze it along its entire data range. That means when in stream processing, you're normally looking at a window of data as it's flying by. This concept allows you to look at the entire data at any time you want. You don't have any time limits on how far you want to go back. And this actually allows us to act quickly on complete information. Um, you have the data flowing in, you're pushing it into the database like Postgres, MySQL, MariaDB, and then you can do your real-time analytics. And you might decide to take action on that. And the action might again affect what you measure, and I'll come to some examples about that. So the whole idea is shorten the loop. You generate data, you do your analytics on the data, and you change the world, and you measure how the world changes as a result of it. Let's talk about one example. This is a network monitoring case. So um, let me take that slide slightly more abstract. It's quite a mouthful here. <laughs> so what we did is we took a network card that is capable to inspect every single packet in a 10 gigabit line, even if it's sent at the smallest size. And that is a hell of a lot of packets. We're talking tens of millions. And if any one of you has worked with relational databases, your magic numbers normally between 50 and maybe 200,000 interactions with the database a second. Here, as I said, we're looking at something like 15 million. And you can actually do more even. And what we're doing is we are taking this network interface card, we're monitoring every packet, we are making sense of what has happened, who sent it, to whom did it go, how much payload was there, and so on and so forth, which protocol, which port, and we move all that data into our database, and then you can query it in the database, and you can very quickly analyze it. And 
you can also generate a lot of data <laughs> very quickly, which is why, uh, one of the reasons why we are compressing data in order to make it more manageable. And what I have is a simulation of that case. So we have a load generator that simulates this kind of uh, application. And I just want to share that with you. Yeah, there we go. So um, what you see is you have um, the ingestion speed. And ingestion means basically a row of data that you're interested in moving into the database. And you see the huge yellow bar. That is the Swarm64 extension for PostgreSQL. And then you have that tiny gray bar. This is actually Postgres itself. So you see there's a subtle difference, I would say. So you have um, us oscillating at between 17 to 20 million rows per table. So this is basically ingesting into a single table. We're capable to push in uh, 17 to 20 million rows. And on the other hand, you have Postgres being able to do between 0 0.2 and 0 0.3. And in total, we have ingested 8 billion rows in a period of time versus Postgres uh, 133 million. That's quite a difference. And the cool thing is, it's still Postgres. You can still use everything you want in Postgres. It's just an extension. It just extends a system that is nice, working, beautiful, fully featured, got great abilities with the Swarm64 solution. And you can do real-time applications with this. Let's look at another case, just to make it a little more concrete. So uh, we looked at a industrial uh, IoT case where somebody was collecting um, data from machines. And the challenge was, since all these machines had different manufacturers, the data would always be different. And as a result, what happened was they would get a very sparse array because sometimes you would have a sensor measurement and sometimes not, depending on who was the manufacturer of the machine, how was it set up, and so on and so forth. So we worked together with them, and we used that uh, binary JSON functionality of Postgres I was talking about earlier. And we used that to actually run this example case. So from a MongoDB approach where we had a collection, every machine had its own collection, we made it a bit more relational database-y. We asked them what are your most important sensor measurements that you're normally filtering for. And then they told us, and we, we extracted them out. But we still also kept the entire JSON data, because you want to have that wealth of information in case you need it. And then we were able to ingest it about um, 10 times faster in terms of pushing it into the database. And then we were also able to uh, query it between 2.5 and 10 times faster inside Postgres using our extension. And the nice thing about this is, if you're really looking at doing loops, as in I'm improving the world, and I'm then measuring how well have I improved it, and then I want to take action again and do some more improvements, this kind of time saving is crucial, because it has the potential to shorten your runs from hours to minutes, or from minutes to seconds. Now one topic I'm very, very excited about is this whole smart city concept. Imagine if you can, within simple systems that are not so complex and that have a very low latency in terms of measurement to action, really adjust how a city, for example, is run to reduce the pollution, to measure how traffic is flowing, and so on and so forth. And all that with the kind of consistency you get from a database. So this is one of the things that I find very exciting and we're actually looking for project in that area as well. So this whole sensor world is something we're very excited about and we're really thinking there should be more Postgres used. Um, yeah, so this is a project that I find very exciting. So um, who are we? Uh, we are um, now 25, we've been around since 2011. We're here in Berlin. We actually, the project started at Beta House in Berlin. I don't know if this is now to our benefit or to our detriment, but <laughs> anyway, it was great. It was really a showing how co-working can bring people together. 
And um, we are also based out of Oslo. So um, Scandinavian German company. And um, we are having a customer integration team uh, that is, so, so all the cases I was talking about now, they're not some kind of hypothetical runs. This is actually things we've really done with customers. So um, we're very happy to do POCs, especially if it's exciting projects. We love that. Um, and we used to be basically designing, so a lot of people in our teams have been designing integrated circuits, which is why they can work with these complex units that are called FPGAs, field programmable gate arrays. So we have that mix of software and hardware. Um, yeah, and uh, we're a team who've done it before. Like, there's a lot of startups we've built up and some of them sold. Yeah, and uh, we are very heavily growing. In the moment, our going rate is like two to three new team members every month. And uh, we're also, of course, open to speak to anyone who thinks of, yeah, this sounds exciting. So both if you think you can use it, it can be an application that is beneficial to your application case, or on the other hand, if it is something that you think, oh, wow, I would like to find out, get to know this team, please talk to me.